How's it going, everyone? Max here, Wealthier by the Day. Day 15, we're going to get into it. I got three topics I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm not a financial professional. This is investment uh, for entertainment purposes only, this video. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe. So hopefully you've been following along. And again, I got three topics I'll cover. The first one we're going to talk about is dividend kings and dividend aristocrats. Why you should think about investing in some of these companies, what these companies are, and I guess the reason why maybe you wouldn't invest in them, which is they're always, they're typically excellent businesses. And th there's kind of a reason they've, they've uh, fallen into these two categories. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is what I think is the best brokerage uh, firm you should invest with. It's who I invest with. And I'll give you the reasons on why I think they're the best and why you should consider either picking them if you haven't started investing or potentially switching over, which is actually what I did. And I'll kind of give you my anecdotal um, story and evidence and all that. And the last thing we're going to talk about is ooh, why you should pay yourself first, right? Um, a lot of people might say, I don't have money to invest this, that, and the other. Y you can invest with very small amounts of money in the stock market if you pick the right broker. So there really is never any reason why you should never be investing in the stock market, even if it's like $50, I'm telling you. You should be consistently pumping money into the market, even if it is very small amounts of money. I guarantee everyone can find $50 a month somewhere. I know that only adds up to, what's that, $600 a year? $600 a year is better than nothing a year, I'm telling you right now. You want, you just, you want to do what you can. So that's what we're going to talk about. Let's get into it. So dividend kings and dividend aristocrats, what are they? A dividend aristocrat is a company that is included in the S&P 500. That's, a, that's something people forget. They have to be included in the S&P 500 that have been paying a dividend for 25 plus years. A dividend king is any company that has been paying a dividend for 50 plus years. So you can be a dividend king and a dividend aristocrat um, or basically all, all dividend kings are not dividend aristocrats because not all dividend kings are a part of the S&P 500, if that makes sense. So there's that the, the dividend king and a dividend aristocrat. Not only is it kind of confused on what constitutes one in each situation, but it's all people also confuse um, like which companies are actually dividend kings and dividend aristocrats because there is bad data out there and I've even I've even missed some companies and I didn't know what's what or who's who. So that that, that is an it, that is a problem and some people might say so and so is a dividend aristocrat, other people might be like, no, that data is incorrect. So do your research, figure out who is who and what is what. Um, I'll tell you right now, majority of dividend aristocrat and dividend kings, I would say mainly dividend aristocrats, um, but dividend kings, this could also apply to them. Majority of the time, these are very uh, secure businesses that don't have a ton of growth, um, but are very profitable, real businesses that actually provide a real service. Like these are... Um, you know, consumer goods companies, grocery stores, you know, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo. Uh, you have a lot of utility companies as far as dividend kings go. Uh, you have some energy companies in there. Uh, what else? Ton of uh, like industrial companies. 3M's a big one. Uh, just to name like name a few. Altria, uh, ticker symbol MO is a big dividend king. That's a tobacco company, which is a consumer staple. So anyways, there's there's a ton of them. Right. But you have all these companies that are typically older companies. I mean, they have to be relatively old if they've been paying a dividend for 25 to 50, 25 plus to 50 plus years, right? Just based on their nature of actually paying a dividend that long. And most companies, well, I wouldn't say most companies, not all companies start paying a dividend right away. So you think that before they even started paying a dividend, they were in business uh, building their company, right? So these are all typically profitable businesses. Um, and they are typically trading at high valuations. I, from what I've seen, I keep an eye on all of these companies from time to time, a lot of the time because I'm creating Instagram posts around them. So whenever I'm going and researching a company that I'm going to include in an Instagram post, typically, especially if I have a minute, I will just go and look at their valuation briefly to see if it's in an interesting investment to me. It's kind of like killing two birds with one stone. When I work on that Instagram page, a lot of the posts are you could say somewhat recycled this and that, but they are updated posts. They have updated st data. And um, if companies are becoming uh, great, better valued, I will 
have a tendency to want to include them more than a very overvalued company because those are companies I want to put it out there because that way I am thinking about like it's kind of almost like my watch list in a way some of those posts I, I sometimes go through those posts and it helps inform what I'm going to invest in because I know I did the research and I thought okay this is going to be a good deal or it's not going to be a good deal so anyways um, but, but what I typically notice with kings and aristocrats and specifically dividend aristocrats is all of them pay at a relatively high premium for basically for where they're at in the life of their business you know these are companies that they're not growing profits like crazy like they're maybe they're having like five percent revenue growth some of them maybe two or three percent but they're not growing like crazy these are businesses where the growth has kind of been played out and that's just kind of what you would that's what you would uh, expect to be honest like so when you are going to buy these businesses what you want to look for are companies that have uh, been beaten down recently in, in share price. But first, you want to figure out why have they been beaten down? Is it legitimate? And is the, is the share price just low because of some bad news and the company is going to bounce back? Like, is it is this bad news affecting their fundamentals? If not, it's like we well, should consider buying if it's in a price range that you think is reasonable. So a lot of people will just consistently buy dividend kings and dividend aristocrats kind of regardless of their valuation, which is that's one way to do it. Like, I'm not telling you, you shouldn't do that. Like they're probably going to consistently go up in value as far as capital appreciation goes consistently. And they're going to be consistently increasing their dividend, but at a marginal pace. So, I mean, if you're doing that strategy, I would say, okay, you're probably going to probably meet market returns. You're probably not going to beat the market. Uh, maybe you'll underperform slightly, but at the same time, maybe you're getting a little bit bigger dividend, which some people regard like, Although it doesn't really matter, it's it's all apples to apples, you know, like capital appreciation plus dividends equals total return. Some people do, for whatever reason, like getting higher dividend payments. I think it's motivating for them. It kind of fuels their investing, that passive income coming in. It wants them to put in more money and create more passive income, where share price appreciation, maybe it doesn't do it for them as much. So that's a kind of a caveat you have to consider when it comes to people's kind of investing methodology. Um, but with that said, me personally, I would not invest in most dividend aristocrats purely because they trade incredibly high valuation. Coca-Cola is one example of a company that they have like a 30% profit margin, incredibly profitable company, great business. Like if you're going to invest in a business, you want to invest in Coke. However, you don't want to invest in Coke at a super premium, like, and they're trading at a super premium. They probably have a PE ratio in the mid twenties. Their price to book is probably like three or four. I don't even know. Maybe it's higher than that. Uh, and like personally for me, I'm like, there's much better buying opportunities out there. I'd rather invest in the S&P 500 at that point and, and kind of have that historical data backing me with a relatively, you know, like reasonable return than, than put my money in Coke and risk. Oh, this lighting is poor. I, I apologize. And risk um, underperforming the market. Like it just at that point, I'd rather just put my money in the S&P 500 or an international index fund or ETF for that matter for some diversification purposes. However, like if you can buy something like 3M, for example, they're not trading at an amazing valuation right now. You could maybe say fair value. You want to look like for like deals like that. Some people might say, well, I'm not investing in 3M right now because they're in this legal battle and lawsuit and this and that. I personally have not invested in them since all this bad news has come out because I, I think there's better buying opportunities in smaller uh, companies that are trading at better valuations. But for someone who's maybe a little more risk adverse and they really want to add some 3M because of their dividend aristocrat and king status, that's a twofer right there. Then like th that, for example, is a good company to look into at least. Like 3M is one of those kings or aristocrats. But I'd say, yeah, that looks pretty good. I also remember Stanley Black & Decker, ticker symbol SWK, looking pretty, um, at least underpriced compared to what it usually trades at. So that's another one you might want to look into. But I mean, like, especially dividend aristocrats, they're going to trade at a premium. I mean, you do have to take that into consideration when you're considering whether you're going to invest in them or not. But at the same time, I mean, look for better opportunities outside that, like, especially if you're a retail investor, like, like the risk to reward ratio of putting a hundred dollars into Coca-Cola versus a hundred dollars into a super undervalued stock like Paramount, for example, which doesn't pay as big a dividend and is, you know, is like, 
it kind of has been beaten down lately, like you're probably going to make a lot more money in the long run investing in something that's undervalued versus a king or aristocrat. Like those kings and aristocrats, I'm not saying that anyone can't just invest in them. But I mean, someone maybe that and me I, at that point, I'm just like, I'd probably put my money in the S&P 500. Like I'd rather just pick something. I don't know, like, especially if they're trading at a premium, but maybe like an older investor, someone that's kind of less risk adverse and they don't care if their returns are questionable and maybe they want a little bit of a higher dividend yield. I don't know. Maybe they've worked something out where they're not taxed as heavily on that passive income, uh, i.e. they're a real estate professional and they have some of their real estate losses or deductions applying to some of that uh, passive income from dividends. That's a very nuanced example, but I mean, as you can see, there might be a reason to do it. So um, I guess bottom line, if you're going to invest in kings or aristocrats, make sure you're doing your homework and checking the valuation uh, along with the dividend information, because I imagine maybe that's some of the allure to you, but do your homework and make sure the valuation lines up. Um, that way you're not just met, uh, wasting your money. Like there's there's opportunity costs there that might, might you might be uh, missing out on uh, better gains down the road or less risky gains with better assets. So that's just my two cents. Next, we'll go into the broker that I think is best, and that is Fidelity. Uh, I think I mentioned this in another video. I switched over to Fidelity over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, uh, because I wanted to consolidate all my retirement accounts that I rolled over from previous jobs, as well as my personal brokerage account. And I wanted to get a 529 account set up for my daughter which all of that can be done in one place. So it's my one-stop shop. Uh, with that said, I was investing with Robinhood prior to that as far as my standard brokerage account went. And then I had a Vanguard Roth IRA because I really like Vanguard. But I, I ended up switching over from that because with Vanguard, uh, I was unable to buy, a, I'm trying to think. I don't think I was able to buy fractional shares on like certain assets and I just hate, I don't like the, I, I like fractional share investing, which means if you have a hundred dollars, you can literally just buy a hundred dollars of company A, even if their stock trades at $200. So you buy half a share like that, 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 um, capability or, uh, of the platform to invest in dollar amounts, dollar figures, fractional shares, rather than full share amounts is to me is paramount for a retail investor. And everyone should have that capability because like in the beginning of the video, like I was saying, if you have $50 to invest, you, you can invest that money. Like there's, you should have that capability to invest whatever you have, especially if you are a retail investor and probably don't have a ton of cash to invest. That's the vast, vast majority of people. So do, do yourself a favor if you, you don't have a brokerage account yet and pick Fidelity. If you live in the United States or a company that supports that platform and you have the the possibility to do that. It's a great platform. Um, and not only that, but that is the fractional share investing. They offer Roth IRA, which is great. Um, you can invest on leverage, which I don't personally do. But if you're someone who's done your homework and you feel like it is basically the rate of return you could get in the market will cover your cost of the loan amount and, and then some, and you'll make some more money on it, then something to consider. Um, and then along with that, the user, user interface is super it's super easy to use and it looks awesome. I mean, I really enjoy the platform, especially the desktop version. The mobile version is cool too, but I'm more of a desktop guy myself as far as my preference. Um, and like I said, you can consolidate all these uh, accounts in one spot. I've rolled over about three IRAs or three uh, 401ks from different jobs and I settle all of them in my Roth uh, IRA on Fidelity. That's, that's my move. So, that plus I got a 529 account there. So if you're a parent or you're an adult or you plan on having kids, that's a that's actually a great uh, uh, topic for another video. But we'll talk 529 account. Uh, look into Fidelity because you can you can support a 529 account there. But um, yeah, that's just my two cents. I really like Fidelity. I'm obviously not sponsored by them in any way, or I don't re receive commission. I'm just an average retail investor. Um, but it's such a great platform and they're also a private company, um, which I don't know, maybe some people that, that means something to them, but, um, no, they're a great company and they also have some really cheap index funds. Once you get onto their platform that you can buy, uh, with super low expense ratio. So you can even save a tiny bit of money there by using their index funds rather than maybe using an ETF that charges you like 0.02% more from an expense standpoint, which I know is marginal and probably is not going to move the needle, but it's just another little benefit of the platform. Um,
So anyways, yeah, that's why I would recommend Fidelity. If you're a newer investor, 100% go with it. Uh, if you are a, I guess, an investor that's already, uh, you know, uh, investing with another broker. I mean, consider it. Like I said, I made the switch. It was probably a day or two worth of paperwork trying to figure stuff out, getting transfer forms filled out, etc. But it wasn't that bad. And I'm really happy I made the switch now that I did. Uh, I did like Robinhood while I was using it. That also offers fractional share investing. To me, that's a great starter platform Like to get someone started in investing. Uh, I think, in fact, that's probably... I, I never use some of the other like more tech related brokerages, but that was a great platform to start with. I love that user interface. I don't, it's like nostalgic to me looking at it just because it reminds me back when I first started investing and was like obsessed with just watching charts move. Not like I was analyzing them, but just watching the chart move would just like, it was just like so exciting. But anyways, um, yeah, fidelity for the long run for sure. Anyways, we'll move on to the next one. So I'm already what 60 minutes, geez. Okay, this is going to be paying yourself first. Now, this is an idea where, I mean, the, the actual, like, lingo itself comes from Rich Dad Poor Dad. At least, that's, what I, that's where I got it from. I'm sure other people would probably notice that, uh, I guess, saying is like paying yourself first. But paying yourself first really just means you should think of your investments almost as priority over everything else as far as expenses go. Like, your investments should turn into the main expense in your life. You should prioritize that that's not always going to be feasible. Like you never want to prioritize investments if there is loss, like basically if you're going to get penalized with interest or something like from debt, like obviously that doesn't make sense. Like you should take care of the things that are going to be the biggest liability first, if need be, but always keep investing in the back of your head. Even if you do have debt, like if you have like a car payment, obviously you, like, you, you can't default on your car payment or your mortgage or something like that. But after you pay that, then investing should be number two, I guess. Uh, so think of investing as less about, less about it's the last thing that you consider when you get your paycheck. And it's like, either it's the first or the second thing. I mean, again, we, and I've discussed this in videos, there's a ton of, uh, areas where you can cut costs in your life. And sometimes it might sting a little bit because maybe you have a bad habit of spending money in certain places where you don't really need to be spending money. But again, that comes to kind of rewiring your brain a bit and uh, reprioritizing your what's in a, a good habit and what's a bad habit and kind of going through that whole process of, uh, I guess, uh, kind of getting real with yourself and identifying places where you can improve. Uh, finan not, not only financially, but just in general, it's like you clean up one habit It maybe they call it like a, a keystone habit as a habit that once you clean that habit up, all of a sudden everything else kind of falls into place. So, um, sorry. Um, so maybe, maybe some of that spending is a keystone habit. Maybe once you clean up that one bad financial habit, you end up cleaning up a bunch of things because a lot of your bad behavior is in a way tied to that one bad behavior, if that makes sense. So um, just pay, pay yourself first. Consider investing. Make, make it a priority. Again, some this is going to be a lot easier for some people rather than others. One, one thing I think that can be really uh, an easy way of doing this is if, if you have an employer and they offer you a 401k, namely a Roth 401k, like match that investment amount. And even if you're just doing that, that's the best. Like, you're doing the bare minimum that I would say you're ahead of the vast majority of people. So pay yourself first. Easy way to do it is to pull out money like in your paycheck because then the money never hits your account and you don't have the option of spending it. So that's a really easy, like, I guess, hack to do that. But let's say you're not doing that. You don't, you have a Roth IRA or a personal brokerage account, whatever, just, Make a priority of, uh, and you can do automatic uh, investing, like automatic withdrawal into your account. So maybe that's something you look into. But like me, I, I'm gung ho about investing. So I mean, I, the first thing I ever think about when I get a paycheck is how much of this can I realistically invest without having to dip back into my investment account or without getting myself into a little bit of financial trouble, get in a financial frenzy. Um, so I don't know, try practicing that, like make, make it a goal, put it on a list. Uh, I want to invest $200 a week. You get your paycheck, you make the investment, check it off the list. 
like that'll keep you accountable. That'll help. Or maybe loop your spouse in, uh, your parents, whoever, tell them you have this goal, try to have them hold you accountable. Like whatever works, whatever's going to keep you accountable. So those are the three points for today. I won't harp on that last one too much. That's pretty self-explanatory. And again, that's a, that's going to be a reoccurring theme for as long as I'm doing these videos, which I mean, right now, my goal is to get to a month and after a month, it's two months, etc. So I'm going to be doing these a lot, a lot of reoccurring themes, but a lot of the stuff I'm telling you is good stuff to hear over and over again. I find that if I'm really knowledgeable on a subject and I already know a lot about something, it never hurts hearing it again to kind of uh, reignite that fire, kind of reinvigorate you, get you excited again, because sometimes you may know something, but it gets kind of stale and boring. And hearing about it again in maybe a little bit different way, explained a little differently, can uh, it can really kind of spark the novelty of that topic uh, again. So, um, if anything, that, that's these videos are going to be great for keeping you on track, keeping you accountable. Like it, this stuff's not easy for everyone. Believe me, I know when you're interested in something. I know how easy it can be to stay on track when you're not so interested it's like it's a bit of a chore so i'm with you anyways guys three topics for today were dividend kings and dividend aristocrats should you be investing in them and if you should be like when should you buy them when when would be a t time and place for you to do that second thing was a great brokerage account i recommend to everyone that'd be fidelity and again this isn't financial advice right i have to say that um, this is purely for entertainment purposes only and this is what i would be doing and the third thing was paying yourself first and what that means and maybe some tips and tricks on how you can do that, especially if you're the person that isn't super interested in paying themselves first. Um, cutting down on expenses, making some kind of automatic payment deal or withdrawal, something like that, that, that could be helpful. So anyways, guys, that is the video. Um, I'm jumping on another freeway right now, but stay tuned for more. I really appreciate all the support and like always, I, you know, I hope this stuff helps. That's the point. Take it easy.